Okay, in uh, 9-3, we're going to talk about how political parties begin to emerge. Now, if you remember from the last lesson, I mentioned that George Washington had warned against political parties. Uh, you know, when Washington entered office, there really wasn't any political parties. Um, many Americans were distrustful of political parties, in fact. They had seen uh, some of the division that political parties had occurred that had, had happened in England, and they do not want this to happen in the United States. But despite these warnings and despite the fact that Americans aren't crazy about political parties, in fact, two political parties begin to emerge during Washington's presidency. You know, as I mentioned, uh, George Washington Americans were distrustful of political parties. They thought they were a threat to national unities, that um, they would pose one side against another, which they often do. And um, what happens, though, is two of his cabinet members, and two of the most important cabinet members, and you can probably figure out who these two are, Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. You know, they're, they're, they're brilliant men, both of them. Hamilton's truly a genius, though. But Hamilton grew up way different than Jefferson. Hamilton was born in the West Indies. He was born into poverty. His mother was, um, how do I say this politely? Um, many think that she may have been a prostitute. Uh, she was married to, or not married, I, I don't even know if she was married or not, but I think he was, to a, a British ship captain who abandoned the family. Mom died when he was young, so he grew up. And by the way, Hamilton get in, uh, got into business in the shipping trade uh, where he flourished, but it was really the shipping was the shipping of African slaves. So he was part of the triangular trade. So he saw the very worst of human nature. His mother being, um, you know, probably not a respectable member of society. Father had been in the family. He has seen the horrors of the uh, of the slave trade. So this all shapes Hamilton's perception of of the human condition. And he, I, I got to tell you, I don't think he's a big fan. Now Jefferson, on the other hand, you know, he he was uh, he was a wealthy Virginian planter. He was kind of um, if you there wasn't aristocracy per se in the United States, but if there was, he'd been part of it. He was wealthy, he's formally educated, he had the finest things in life, but yet he dressed formally, he spoke casually, his manner was more of a common man. Unlike Hamilton, who I think he uh, overcompensated his poor background, he dressed very formally, he he behaved himself with the utmost, uh, you know, uh, social graces, almost trying to overcome uh, his his poverty-filled background. Jefferson, who had the money, who had been raised in riches, kind of acted more like the common everyday man. But these guys, you know, th their biggest uh, issues, I guess, is what's the best way to lead the country? Both of them feel what they are doing <coughs> is what's best for the country, all right? Okay, so Hamilton's view of the economy is it should be modeled after Great Britain. He's seen the manufacturing boom in England, how uh, England has made itself a powerhouse economically through manufacturing and trade, and he wants America to model himself after that. He thinks that America uh, would be better with uh, stronger manufacturing uh, and trade. And he favors the growth of cities uh, as well as the merchant class. He thinks that that's what's best for the American economy. Now, Jefferson believes in an agrarian or farming uh, economy. Jefferson feels that uh, if manufacturing is going to be uh, the primary economic powerhouse of America, then, then only a very few people are going to have the power and the wealth. Where farmers... You know, they're going to be able to spread out and kind of spread the wealth a little more fairly across the workers of America. You know, in actuality, aren't they both right, though? I mean, we do need strong manufacturing. We still need uh, a, a great agrarian uh, agricultural economy, uh, not one over the other. I think they're both right, but they don't see that. They favor one or the other, where I see it should be both. So we have these two men with different political views, and as you might imagine, people who uh, agree with Hamilton 
kind of gather together. People that gather or uh, that agree with Jefferson gather together. And it's just like anything. You know, if you have a group of, uh, of friends and you kind of agree on the same kind of music and the same kind of clothes and the same kind of movies and TVs, you tend to group together. So parties kind of naturally occur. So here's what hap- happens. Hamilton's uh, group of people become known as the Federalists. Federalists. Uh, Jefferson's group are called the Democratic Republicans, or the Republicans, we'll call them. Now, very important, they're not Democrats as we know today, and they're not Republicans as we know today. Okay, so make sure you understand that. The Democratic Republicans favor Jefferson. All right, let's break this down and find out what they really believe. All right, the Federalists believe that really the wealthy and the educated should lead the country. Wealthy and educated. Wealthy and educated. Uh, wow. Well, Jefferson believes the people should have the power. Now, I know you're going to think that everybody should have the power, and you're probably right. Um, but I think we also should agree that we need an educated uh, group of people. We don't want people that don't understand the issues or how the government works or, um, you know, uh, who, who, who really don't um, understand the pressing needs of our country making decisions. And that's what Hamilton believes. Now, remember, this is in the 1790s, and a lot uh, of people aren't formally educated. So Hamilton kind of comes across as a little bit presumptuous, or a little bit pretentious, I should say, that only the wealthy and the educated are smart enough and are care enough, uh, and they're the people that should lead the country. Jefferson argues that the people, all the people, should have the power. My counter-argument would be that I agree the people should have the power, but I do think the people should become educated. All right? Again, let's go back. The Federalists believe that a strong central government. That's why they're called Federalists, federal government. Where the Republicans believe in a strong state government. So they're going to disagree on who should be the major power in America. Should be the federal government or should be the state government. Okay? Now, as we mentioned earlier, the Federalists believe that manufacturing, shipping, and trade should be the driving force behind our economic growth, where the Republicans, under Jefferson, believes it should be farming and agriculture. All right. Now, here's a big one. The Federalists are pro-British. They admire the British. Yes, you know, they they weren't happy about uh, uh, living under British domination and British rule. But they admire them. They favor them. They think that of the powers of Europe, British is the good guys. Where Jefferson believes, and and the Republicans are pro-French. French. Remember, Jefferson had been our ambassador to France. Okay? Now, Hamilton, if you remember, because he's Secretary of the Treasury, had favored the National Bank, the Bank of the United States. Uh, he believes that there should be a bank where we can deposit our money, pay our debts, and make loans. Now, the Republicans oppose the National Bank. You know why? Because it's not in the Constitution. Not in the Constitution. So, they oppose the National Bank. All right. Hamilton, again, favors a protective tariff, a tax on imported goods. If we have this tax on imported goods, it's going to make our costs... Uh, it's not going to reduce our costs, but it's going to make imported goods, manufactured items we bring in from other countries, more expensive. Thus, people will tend to buy American goods. Now, the Republicans, remember, Jefferson is, by the way, from Virginia, which is a southern state, opposes the protective tariff because people in the South buy a lot of stuff from European countries. So they are against this protective tariff because it's going to cost them more money. Hamilton believes in a loose interpretation of the Constitution. So the Federalists believe that, yes, we should look at the Constitution for guidance, but we're not going to take it verbatim. We're going to use it as a guide. Where the Republicans say, no, sir, a strict, strict interpretation of the Constitution. If it doesn't say it in the Constitution, then it cannot happen. All right? Now, who supports the Federalists? Merchants, as you might well imagine. Uh, guests, and manufacturers. These two groups support the Federalists. Where the people that support the Republicans are small farmers, 
because they support an agrarian economy. And the artisans, you know, more of the blue-collar folks, they support the Republicans. So you have these two political parties, the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, known as Republicans, and now newspapers start to take sides. Now, the thing that's interesting, and it surprised many European visitors, is that Americans were really literate. They uh, Many of them could read. And uh, if, if you think about it, it has a lot to do with our Puritan background, where everybody believed that they should uh, read the Bible, and uh, you know many people were literate. So these newspapers have a huge influence on this political debate. But these newspapers, uh, man, they they tend to be a little bit. Uh, uh, they don't necessarily believe that it has to be all fact. They mix rumors, they mix innuendos uh, with facts. So I mean, these are they're brutal attacks on each other, and uh, you know some of the newspapers back the Federalists, some of them back the Republicans, and they heavily influence the American or the public opinion. Okay, so uh, these newspapers uh, have a huge. Remember, there's no TV, there's you know no radio, so the newspapers are going to be uh, the vehicle that gets the message out to the public, and these newspapers start backing one party or the other. They're not um, taking more of a, you know, a, a fair and balanced approach. They are actually choosing sides. So this leads us to the election of 1796. And these political parties are going to influence this election. And of course, the papers as well. All right. So the Republicans back Thomas Jefferson for president. And Thomas Jefferson um, selects Aaron Burr as the VP. Vice President. Now the Federalists back John Adams for President and Thomas Pinckney for Vice President. But it has a very unusual result. Okay, the Constitution at that time said that the person with the most electoral votes gets to be the President, and whoever comes in second gets to be the Vice President. So, guess what happens? John Adams wins uh, majority of the electoral vote, so he is the president, and he's a federalist. But guess who comes in second? Not his choice, not Thomas Pickney, but Thomas Jefferson, a Republican, becomes vice president. And this increases tension. Now, can you imagine if, uh, you know, in 2012, we had Barack Obama running for president. You know, he was the incumbent. He was running for re-election. And we have Mitt Romney. A Republican. Can you imagine if uh, Barack Obama wins, he's the president, but Mitt Romney comes in second, he's the vice president? Do you think Mitt Romney would be supporting Barack Obama's policies? No, he'd probably be in the cave, man. Uh, you should have voted for me because I wouldn't do it this way. So we now have, in this election of 1796, a Republican who is not going to support a Federalist. So there's going to be increased tension. This is uh, probably not a good way to run the federal government. And, of course, this is going to lead to a change in the Constitution. All right? So there you have it. We're going to leave you here with John Adams taking over. He's going to be the second president. um, And his vice president is going to be Thomas Jefferson, who is from a different political party. Let's see how well this works. See you next time.